Hello, I'm Steve Stilianos. If you look back at the programs from the past APSA annual meetings, I'm certain that you will not find many sessions on peer support. To be fair, the lack of attention toward physician well being simply reflected the professional culture of the past. We are all aware of the compassion that pediatric surgeons demonstrate for sick children and their families. We simply fell short in how we took care of each other and ourselves. I offer to share my reflections with you, not because they are unique, but rather my story may illustrate what many have been through with varying lasting effects. I was 12 years out from fellowship and felt valued as a clinician and as an educator. I counseled a couple whose unborn child had a giant abdominal wall defect. We discussed options, made a plan, but I changed that plan shortly after birth due to an instinct instinctive reaction after assessing the newborn's anatomy. Things went terribly wrong with escalating complications and this scenario short-circuited all of my previously adequate coping mechanisms. Not your classic medical error of cutting or removing something you should not have done. It was making a bad decision that didn't work a failure. As I now read about physician responses to adverse events, well, I manifested it all. Guilt, shame, and probably worst of all, a complete disconnection from my previous identity as a competent pediatric surgeon who could always figure out the right thing to do for a patient. I was isolated and filled with self-doubt. We all know that we are tougher on ourselves than anyone else, but I was certain that all of my neonatal and surgical colleagues and trainees would lose trust in me, let alone the family that was suffering. Much worse, is that I had lost complete trust in myself. Well, I cared for that newborn and his parents for 62 straight days until the baby died. Every daily visit confirming how much I had let this family down. Many incorrect assumptions followed. First was that time would allow me to reset and that I would return back to normal. This did not occur. If you're asking whether I sought help, the answer is no. I had no real precedent for that at the time. If you're asking, did anyone reach out to help me? Well, the answer to that is a bit more complicated. I hid my turmoil as best I could and functioned. I was blessed with caring partners at work who obviously recognized the bad outcome, but no one else was assigning blame to me except for me. I sensed that my partners were giving me space out of respect, a reaction I understood. As a matter of fact, I overheard the neonatologists and nurses commending my lengthy daily visits and emotional counseling sessions with the family. This simply amplified my sense of guilt and shame. I now know that the missing piece to my story is that I never spoke of this event out loud to someone who would understand the visceral aspects of what I was going through. Those festering toxic emotions were never neutralized. And that is where I think timely peer support can be so valuable. The power of the narrative to actually hear yourself tell your story, especially to a peer, can certainly help facilitate coping and resilience and begin the healing and recovery. Here is where the concept of self-compassion really resonates. As time passed, the ultimate challenge for me was regaining my identity. Was I going to be defined by this adverse event or was I going to grow as an individual and become a better surgeon by working through the clinical details and the pain and the guilt and the grief. I'm very confident that the newer generation of pediatric surgeons is going to get this right 
and I would be happy to assist in any way. I'll end by asking you to take care of each other, and I thank you for listening. I just want to thank Steve Stilianos for being vulnerable today and describing a really challenging time for him. And I'm Lauren Berman. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a pediatric surgeon at Nemours. I'm really happy to be here with Holly Antle, who's our program director of our peer support program at Nemours, which has been up and running now for two years. And we are here today to talk to you a little bit more about second victim syndrome to build upon what you learned last time from Kurt Heiss and start to introduce the concept of peer support and how peer support can help people like Steve, might have helped Steve when he was going through that difficult time. Go to the next slide. So just to remind everyone what a second victim is, uh, this is a healthcare provider who's involved in an unanticipated adverse patient event who experiences psychological and emotional trauma. And this was first described back in 2000. Next slide. There is a lot of research that has been done to describe the path that second victims take as they hopefully recover from the event. Um, and this is how they feel. Um, they feel personally responsible for the unexpected outcome. They believe they have failed their patients. They second guess their clinical skills, their knowledge base, and their career choice. They feel fear, guilt, anger, embarrassment, and humiliation, and this can persist for months or years. Uh, they have reduced job satisfaction and they lose confidence and they're afraid they'll continue to make errors. So if any of these feelings feel familiar to you as you're listening, just know that it is not just you, this is well described. Next slide. So we did a survey of the APSA membership a couple of years ago, measuring many different aspects of wellness and well-being. And one of the areas we asked questions about was our experience with medical errors and adverse patient outcomes. And what we found was that nearly 80% of us answered on the survey that we have personally experienced a medical error that resulted in significant patient harm or death. So almost all of us experienced this at some time in our careers. Next slide. And not everyone who experiences a significant medical error or adverse patient outcome goes on to develop second victim syndrome. But there has been research done about who's more at risk. And I've highlighted in red some of the risk factors that apply to pediatric surgeons. As you can see on the screen, um, we often have special connections with families, uh, as well as being surgeons and taking care of children. And all of these are put us at higher risk for developing second victim syndrome. And you'll also notice that female, being female is a risk factor. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, this, the, the, the fear and the doubt that, that women may be more likely to experience is not necessarily unfounded. This is a disturbing study that was done, which showed that um, referral patterns were really profoundly impacted by a, an adverse patient outcome. So if a female surgeon had a patient die, the referrals to that female surgeon dropped by about a third. And this was not seen for male surgeons uh, who were experiencing similar outcomes. So, that, so the struggle is real. Next slide. So another important finding on the survey, other than how frequently we are experiencing these adverse events, is that we really don't feel supported by our institutions. Less than a quarter of us said we actually felt supported. And here are some direct quotes to explain this low frequency of feeling supported. It doesn't matter where you work. If the error is big enough, you're thrown under the bus and nobody wants to get on the bus with you. People came to Eminem with pitchforks. Colleagues are well-meaning, but often don't know what to say or don't say anything at all because of a sensitive topic. And what we hope is after uh, watching today's episode and the next one is that we will help you have a better sense of what you can say in these situations. Next slide. So there is some research on what actually helps physicians recover after medical error. This was a study doing in-depth interviews with, with people who had experienced adverse patient outcomes and really struggled to recover. Um, and the themes that were detected included talking about it, uh, forgiving yourself, learning how to deal with imperfection, among the others listed on the screen. And what I would like to propose today is that a peer support encounter is a really good venue to uh, help physicians recover, and it, it helps to enable many of the processes that were discovered in these interviews. Next slide. So I think one of the misconceptions is that 
we should give people space and we shouldn't reach out to people after an adverse event. But when we actually asked you and your colleagues, uh, who would you want to be contacted by after an adverse event? Only 11% of us said they, that they didn't want to talk to anyone. Most of us said we would like to be contacted by other surgeons in our practice. So I think this is a really important slide to remember. We want to talk about these events. We don't want to be left alone. Um, and again, we want to give you the tools to have these conversations. Next slide. I really like this one last quote that I'm gonna end with before I turn things over to Holly. Um, Having personally experienced a patient death, I think a peer support program in which participating members are given training in how to support the traumatized physician is an optimal choice. Colleagues are well-meaning, but they don't know what to say or don't say anything at all. The chaplain can be helpful, but can't truly understand because they don't have the same responsibility to a patient. So peer support is the best choice. So uh, we are going to be talking much more about peer support today. I'm gonna to go to the next slide. And the main message that I wanted to get across is, you know, on the left column, it lists a lot of the things that go through our minds that may form barriers and obstacles to us having these conversations. You know, after an adverse event, you may be thinking, oh, he probably wants some time to process. And then he's feeling so isolated and alone. You may be thinking, oh, we should lessen her caseload. She had this really bad outcome and she's thinking they've lost confidence in me and they don't trust me. You may be thinking, I don't want to say, I don't know what to say. And really people just want to be treated normally. And then you might be thinking, well, I don't want to talk about it because it'll remind her of the situation and make her relive it. But meanwhile, she's thinking about it constantly. So keep in mind some of these myths um, and I'm going to turn things over to Holly next, who's uh, going to be talking a bit more about peer support and how to approach these encounters. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lauren. So um, on the heels of that information, I want to share with you um, what we commonly see as a trajectory with second victim syndrome. And again, recognizing um, individual differences in how we all process information, um, as well as individual differences in, in these stages. Uh, but this gives you kind of a broad scope of what we tend to see um, in processing of sec second victim syndrome. And you can see kind of going from stage to stage, a lot of the normed kind of experiences and emotions um, that, that um, providers will go through. Um, and even you can see kind of the outcome is multifold. Um, some go through and, and end up thriving uh, ultimately. Um, some people kind of get past it and then they just move on but don't really process the event. Um, we would categorize that as surviving. Um, and then ultimately there are those, you may know colleagues or have heard of situations where providers have experienced multiple events um, of second victim syndrome and ultimately leave medicine, which we certainly wanna avoid. Where peer support can help is to just change that trajectory or help encourage our colleagues toward thriving. Um, again, in itself, it's insufficient um, as a support mechanism, but it is an important um, support mechanism in the grand scheme of um, how we can support one another through these events. So let's look at what a peer support conversation should look like. Uh, there's some things that we recommend and then some um, aspects of those conversations that we want to avoid. So let's start with what to do and keeping in mind, while we do have a formal peer support program at our center and many of you may say that you have those at your center as well, the intention of this education is to help you provide support in a day-to-day -day basis to those around you in your everyday work environment. You don't have to be a formal peer supporter to provide support to your colleagues. So what that conversation should look like is focusing first on the person and the emotional impact of the event. Uh, many of us who've been um, involved in reviews or um, you know, critical event reviews um, or um, post hoc analysis might have a tendency to you know, recant the event or ask details about the event, but in this supportive conversation, you're really just focusing on the person, person and how they're um, managing and coping with the event. And so to that, we wanna also remain very present focused um, in looking at the current situation rather than you know, looping back to, you know, I know you've had this happen multiple times in your career, this must make it especially difficult for you. We don't wanna kind of recall the past, we wanna just stay really present focused. And then providing support statements that 
just ultimately validate um, the colleague's response to the situation or emotional state. So letting them take the lead. So if you were having an interaction where you asked someone how they're doing, I know you had a stressful day in the OR yesterday, how are you doing? And then the person responds with, well, I'm just, you know, really upset or I'm distressed or, you know, it's been on my mind a lot. A validating statement would simply be to say, I can't imagine that must be so difficult for you. Yeah, those things are very hard. These are very hard situations. Just helping them feel seen and heard. And then consider asking how you can best support them during this time. Lauren shared a slide with myths and you know, different ways that people um, may want to be supported versus how they're being supported. And because there are individual differences, we do encourage you to ask. And sometimes we feel afraid to ask someone how they wanna be supported. We maybe feel like we should already know this, but we're not mind readers. And because everyone is different, even if it's someone you are very close with, you may not know how they wanna be supported in that moment. So simply asking, hey, how can I best support you at this time? Um, asking to check back in. If they say, no, I'm fine right now. Okay, can I check back in with you in a couple of days? I just wanna make sure you're doing okay. This can be really tough. Um, that would be a good way. And these are some of the suggested ways that we'd like for these conversations to take place. On the flip side, we do have some suggestions of um, techniques that we would try to avoid. So we would like to avoid attempting to resolve the trauma or stressor or giving advice. Um, and again, I know some of us kind of step into that role pretty easily. We're fixers. We wanna help someone process this and move on, um, resolve their stress. But really the role of peer support is to help support the person emotionally in the state they're in, not to give advice or be a problem solver. So be on the lookout for those types of questions or statements. Also drilling for details of the event. Again, we referenced this before that we wanna avoid that, um, but to be very specific, we wanna avoid you know, questioning procedures or fact checking or you know, ever doubting what the person did is if the you know, colleague goes into some detail about what happened, you certainly want to, wouldn't want to interject and say, oh, but you did that, or oh, that happened, or giving any kind of look on your face that um, suggests that you're questioning their, their decision making. Also imposing your beliefs. So, you know, statements such as everything happens for a reason um, can sound very dismissive sometimes to those that we're trying to support. Um, or any kind of beliefs that you have. Um, we really wanna be very neutral in supporting um, our colleagues. Cheering up or persuading a shift in emotions. So sometimes we take an approach of saying, hey, this is gonna be okay. You'll get through this, I've been there. Um, and again, the intention there is really to be supportive and encouraging, but in the moment it can really feel dismissive. Um, so we want to avoid that. And then focusing on your own story or previous traumatic event. There's a fine line there that we wanna encourage you to stay on the right side of, which is, you know, at times it is appropriate to share, I've been there, um, so that people, you know, can feel really like this is something that happens to most of us or, you know, to most of them and that they can um, feel supported in that event. But it can turn to, you know, away from a focus on your colleague if you're going into a lot of detail about your event or going, um, into a lot of detail about multiple events or other people that you've supported. You certainly wanna keep confidentiality and not share anything about anyone else in that moment. So again, present focused, you know, avoiding getting into your story and avoiding, avoiding going into you know, previous traumatic events. And right now we're gonna watch a clip um, of a movie you may have seen, <laughs> Inside Out, that can show us an example of peer support. And on the back end, I'm gonna ask you to contemplate which character provided the best support. Um, we'll watch it now. My rocket! Wait, Riley and I were still using that rocket. It, 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 it still has some song power left. Who's your friend who likes to play? No! No, 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 you can't take my rocket to the top. Riley and I go to the moon! Riley can't be done with me. Hey, it's going to be okay. We can fix this. We just need to get back to headquarters. Which way to the train station? I had a whole trip planned for us. <gasps> hey, who's ticklish, huh? Here comes the tickle monster. 
I'm sorry they took your rocket. They took something that you loved. It's gone. Forever. Sadness. Don't make him feel worse. Sorry. It's all I had left of Riley. I bet you and Riley had great adventures. Oh, they were wonderful. Once we flew back in time, we had breakfast twice that day. Sadness! That sounds amazing. I bet Riley liked it. Oh, she did. We were best friends. <laughs> yeah, it's sad. <laughs> I'm okay now. Come on. The train station is this way. Okay. So in that clip, we saw a great display of recommended strategies for supporting your colleagues and strategies we would want to avoid in these situations. And you probably picked up on the fact that surprisingly, sadness was the better peer supporter in this scenario. Sadness really sat with the character um, and was able to validate emotions, be present, um, not try to fix anything. So saying things like, I'm sorry they took your rocket. That's helping that character feel seen and heard. They took something you loved. And just validating an emotion, yeah, it's sad. Um, so really we wanna communicate, you know, it's okay to feel what you're feeling right now and I'm here with you. I'm just sitting here in this moment with you and it's okay. Versus, you know, joy um, for all good intentions, really wanted to play, you know, the fix it, right? Wanted to bring joy to the moment and help that character get out of the feeling of sadness and being down. Um, but that is, you know, these are some strategies we really want to avoid when we're supporting our colleagues, um, you know, detracting, you know, distracting from the moment. Hey, which way to the train station? How do we get out of here? Um, or saying it's okay, we're going to fix this or, you know, trying to make that person laugh. Um, we really, you know, don't want to communicate that these emotions you're having are uncomfortable for me to see and hear, and I don't want to be part of this, and we want to get away from this. So um, hopefully this is a great um, way for you to kind of see in action, an animated way, of course, uh, how to support your colleagues. So in summary, what we've um, learned today is that healthcare providers who experience a traumatic and often unexpected event may experience vic second victim syndrome, and it is very common. Um, particularly, surgeons report a preference of talking about the event with a colleague. Um, we know that from the survey that you all completed uh, with Dr. Berman. Um, and we know that a lot of you really lack trust in organizational resources. So um, having support within your colleagues or within your own physician group can be really helpful. And we also know that supporting colleagues starts with just checking in um, and having that intentional check-in asking someone how they want to be supported, and it's highly recommended. We want to focus on providing a safe space, avoid going into details, reflecting back on the past, and problem solving. So I hope you've learned a lot from today's episode. Up next, we have a third episode and final episode where we're looking inside best practices for how to support a colleague after an adverse event. Thank you for watching. <laughs>